Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, we're going to talk about rain gardens and hopefully inspire you guys to um, start digging in your backyard and incorporating these kinds of stormwater control measures into your existing beds. Um, you know, uh, we're going to, we got an hour, we're going to talk about as much as we can. Uh, this past week, I just did a six hour rain garden, rain garden certification workshop. So there's a lot to building rain gardens. So um, please ask questions, you know, we'll, we'll, um, we'll get as much as we can in here. But I'm Amy Mead. I am the area natural resources agent for Pender, Brunswick and New Hanover counties. I work for North Carolina Cooperative Extension. Um, so I'm, I'm based out in Brunswick County at the government complex. I also work at New Hanover County Arboretum. Um, I had got my start in water quality. I worked down in the Everglades for many years for the South Florida Water Management District. I did um, work in seagrass beds down there looking at phosphorus cycling. Um, so, and I am a plant biologist um, uh, and so um, I've, I've loved lurk, working here at the New Hanover County Arboretum and, um, and, and uh, my, my more recent role is um, doing stormwater education. I'm also, um, I also do pond work, talk about pond buffers and aquatic weeds and all kinds of good stuff. So um, I can, I'm definitely a resource to you all. So if you have any issues uh, related to stormwater or stormwater ponds, please, please give me a call. As I mentioned, today we're gonna talk about um, rain gardens. So let me share my screen here. Oh, eh. hold on one second. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to do that one more time. But, oh, I do want to share my sound. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about gardening for stormwater and wildlife. So we're gonna talk about building a backyard rain garden. Um, you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, um, but so long we have looked at our yards, our urban yards as purely for aesthetic purposes. And so really what I want you to think about today is making our yards functional, also very beautiful. And then you can really provide a lot of wildlife benefit with the choices of plants that you put in these kinds of um, uh, uh, structures. So here on this picture here, this is on the left, this is the New Hanover County Arboretum. This is our stormwater infiltration zone. It's really the centerpiece of our um, efforts to stop water from leaving the Arboretum. Um, it's planted beautifully as a native meadow. So it's got lots of native grasses, perennials, shrubs, and trees in there. And it's just a beautiful area, but incredibly functional. Really no stormwater leaves the Arboretum grounds and goes into Bradley Creek uh, anymore after the, this installation. We'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that later. In the middle here, this is a rain garden that went in at um, the Brunswick County complex. Um, so we'll see pictures of that a little bit later, how to incorporate these rain gardens into uh, larger um, landscaping beds. And then we'll talk about some smaller um, stormwater solutions as well that you can, that just easy fixes that you can do to help keep water on your property. So just a quick tutorial about stormwater. Um, we all live in a river basin. Um, so we can think of a river basin as basically like a big bathtub. So, um, you know, rain falls on this area. It might go into a little ditch, eventually into a little stream, maybe into a larger little streamlet. And then eventually all of the water that falls on this land is gonna end up in the Cape Fear River and head out to the ocean here. A lot of these areas right along the coast um, drain directly into the intracoastal or into the ocean. Um, but each of us has a river basin that we live in. When we're talking about the word stormwater, we're talking about um, water that falls from the sky, falling on impervious surfaces, so hard surfaces that water can't penetrate. And as it's flowing over that, those hard surfaces, it's going to be picking up pollutants. And the important thing to know about stormwater is that it goes untreated into our waterways. So why should we care about this? So as this water is moving over these hard surfaces, it's picking up pollutants. Um, it's picking up sediment, um, one of our number one pollutants in our waterways. It's picking up fecal bacteria. It's picking up PAHs, which is hydrocarbons from oil and gas. 
it's picking up nutrients. So this is why we should never uh, fertilize our lawns right before a big rain and let all that fertilizer wash off. It's picking up pesticides. We see issues with erosion. And you know, when we're overloading these stormwater um, streams and ditches, um, we can see flooding. And we've seen a lot of that here um, in the coastal area. So, you know, I always try to remind people when we, you know, nothing ever just goes away. So when we flush our toilet, when we, uh, you know, pour water down the sink, that goes to a wastewater treatment plant. So that water is treated, it goes out here, gets treated, either it gets released back into the river. Um, but, but this storm water, it, it's picked up when it goes into the storm drain, it's likely going into a creek, it's going to the Cape Fear River, and that water is going untreated and picking up all those pollutants. So we see, I mean, you guys, I don't need to tell you this, our population is booming here in the Cape Fear region. Um, Brunswick County has almost doubled its population in the past 20 years. Uh, New Hanover County is practically running out of room to build more. Um, Fender County moving a little bit slower, it's, uh, you know, keeping a lot of its rural identity down here. Um, but certainly, especially along that 17 corridor, we're seeing really, really accelerated um, development. And so what we see when we have this accelerated development, um, this is a picture of Atlanta, we see an increase in impervious surfaces. So we can imagine, you know, when rain falls on a natural area where there's trees, that rain is going to fall lightly. It's going to um, hit those leaves, fall lightly to the ground, where it's going to find that organic material. It's going to have time to infiltrate back down into the ground. But when water hits these um, uh, impervious surfaces like rooftops, roadways, I mean, it's basically going to move very quickly over those surfaces. So we can look at this, you know, kind of in a graphical form. Um, this graph here has flow rate in cubic feet per, per second here on this axis. We've got time over here. And so again, when rain falls on these natural areas, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to drip lightly to the ground where it's going to, it's going to have time to infiltrate. It might go into small creeks. And as it reaches this creek, it's going to move slowly. We're going to see the flow rate increase in that in that creek or that river, and then it's going to slowly taper off over time. But when we remove all that vegetation, um, now we have a different scenario. We see water moving very quickly over those surfaces, very quickly into creeks. So we're going to see more runoff arriving much faster, and this is where we see issues related to flooding when these things happen. We can also see really tight relationship between impervious land coverage and bacteria. Um, so this is the percent impervious surface coverage. So we can picture that from above. If you took a snapshot of Bradley Creek uh, watershed, which is where the Arboretum is down here, um, how much of that land coverage or land surface is covered by impervious surfaces. So rooftops, roadways, driveways, and then down here, we have our different creeks here. And then the blue is our um, uh, fecal coliform bacteria uh, counts here. And what we see is with increasing um, impervious surface coverage, we see a correlation in increasing fecal bacteria. So this is Bradley Creek um, watershed. This is where the Arboretum is. And we see high, almost, I think it's actually much higher now. This is from 2001. I think it's up around 28% surface coverage. And we see the highest amounts of fecal coliform bacteria um, in Bradley Creek. Much of that is closed to shellfishing. I think I have this right here. Um, much of that is you know, absolutely closed to shellfishing. Um, water quality reports have said it has the highest levels of pollution throughout the county. So um, you don't want to collect shellfish. You don't want to swim in this, this area. And, uh, and that is really closely tied to that impervious surface coverage. Um, so I mentioned, so the New Hanover County Arboretum is on the Bradley Creek watershed. And this property was actually the old Bradley Creek Elementary School. And then in the 80s, it was given to Cooperative Extension to create an arboretum. But over time, the stormwater control measures that we had really became outdated. We're seeing increasing frequency and intensity of storms. And so we were actually flooding the neighbor's property every time we had a large storm. We really needed to figure out how to deal with stormwater on the property. And so 
this is just a quick two minute video. Um, we actually won an amazing award in 2020. Um, and I wanna show you a little bit about what we've done here at Arboretum. As a coastal community and one prone to extreme weather like hurricanes and flooding events, stormwater runoff is a growing threat to the water quality of our watersheds. During heavy rain, stormwater picks up surface contaminants and carries them into our creeks and watersheds. To protect the health of the Bradley Creek watershed, the New Hanover County Arboretum and Cooperative Extension built six stormwater management systems, featuring a rain garden, infiltration zone, cistern, permeable pavement, and a constructed wetland. These innovative systems help keep pollutants out of our waters and prevent flooding in the surrounding environment, and recently won a County Resiliency Award in the 2021 National Association of Counties Achievement Awards recognizing superior work in infrastructure, energy, and sustainability. The beautiful design and functional systems serve as educational models for urban sustainability in management of coastal watersheds. Bioretention areas feature native, low-maintenance landscaping. Rain gardens and cisterns, or rain barrels, offer scalable models of water conservation and stormwater management for both residential and commercial properties. The Arboretum also provides educational outreach to the community, hosting learning opportunities for local students, residents, and developers about preventing flooding and effective urban stormwater solutions. Visit the Arboretum free seven days a week to see how we are improving water quality, preventing flooding, reducing maintenance costs, and protecting county watersheds. That was my little uh, plug for the Arboretum. Um, I'd love for you to come by and, and check out some of these um, features in the landscape. Um, I think you guys will also appreciate a beautiful native plant garden um, and then how we've landscaped out that um, our larger stormwater infiltration zone. Um, we definitely use these um, as educational models. And as, a, as the video mentioned, you know, we use these both to show residents what they can do, but also, you know, what you can do on a larger commercial property especially to retrofit um, uh, some of those older um, developments and these older commercial properties as well. So collectively, a lot of the, you know, we can classify these things as low impact development. So this is a, you know, specific term. It means um, how can we, um, you know, mimic a site's natural surface water uh, and groundwater hydrology. So whatever that land was doing before we developed it, um, we want we want that same that same thing. So instead of pushing all the water as quickly as we can off site, we want to hold that water on site and allow it to infiltrate back into the ground. So there are a lot of things that we can do that are just really easy. One is to disconnect impervious surfaces. That's as easy as turning your downspout um, away from a driveway and into a, a grassy area or into a natural area. If an entire neighborhood did that, you're getting about 12 gallons a minute during a you know, really decent rainstorm. If, if a whole neighborhood did that, you would uh, save a ton of water from going uh, offsite. Um, we can preserve open space and natural features, leave those treed areas. Um, we can add uh, rain gardens or bioretention areas. Um, we can do things like porous pavement. Those are porous pavement, like porous concrete, it's better for commercial properties, but we can do gravel driveways. We'll see about that in a second adding rain barrels, and of course, you guys know, some low input native landscaping. So collectively, these, these things would be called stormwater solutions. Um, we can also call them best management practices. This is a term you've probably heard, BMPs, um, or uh, coming up in the engineering world, you might hear the word stormwater control measures or SCMs. So if you live in a development where there's a pond, that's an SCM. Uh, that's a permitted, you know, that the, that development had to um, come up with a design that would deal with the stormwater on the property. Um, you know, things like permeable pavement, rain gardens. Um, this is a larger 2,000 gallon cistern that we have at the Arboretum. Um, so these are ways that you keep the water on the property, slow it down, soak it in. Oh, I just give away the my tagline here. So collectively, all of these stormwater control measures, this is the main point. We wanna slow the water down, we wanna spread it out, and we want that water to soak back down into the ground rather than going off um, to our, our local waterways. So again, um, easiest thing you can do, is, uh, you know, 
oftentimes it's just the easiest thing for installers to just route that water to your driveway. Just turning, you know, getting a downspout disconnect or a downspout um, uh, connector and just routing that out into the grass and routing it out into a garden bed um, is an easy way to stop that water from going off your property. There are just really cool ways that you can move water on your property. Um, rocks do a really good job at dissipating the energy of water coming down so you can you know, make, make little uh, areas where the water can splash there and gently go back into the ground. You can do dry stream beds if you need the water to move to a specific area. Um, and a lot of those can look really good. I thought this looked kind of neat. They had a, an odd area where the, you know, it would have been hard to route that water, but they put in these rocks here. So we can imagine the water moving gently over this structure and then it having time to slow down and go into the ground. If you don't have um, uh, downspouts and gutters, um, like I said, rocks do a really good job. You can put in a drip line infiltration trench. Um, this will allow that water to hit the ground and not create those big deep uh, ruts. It'll allow it to slow down and, and, um, and soak into the ground. I'm a big fan of rain barrels. I actually have two on my property. This is this one right here. I got from the New Hanover County um, Soil and Water uh, Department. And um, I know they've been having some um, trouble uh, sourcing these. There's a little bit of a supply chain issue, but these are really high quality rain barrels. Um, and I put this rain barrel here mostly because I had a really odd spot. Um, so I had a downspout that was installed that went down here. And it really couldn't go this way because there was a doorway right here. So it actually went out this way all along my deck. It routed it really far away. And then I had water that was sort of ponding in a part of my yard. So um, I, don't, I don't tend to use this water. Um, but what I do is I collect it here. I turn on this little spigot and I let it slowly drip into the ground. So in between rainstorms, I let that water slowly drip out so that it draws down. Um, so it's a passive infiltration of that water, but it, it, it provided me a solution. I've actually planted out, it looks really great now, um, but this was a great solution for this kind of odd spot that I had that was difficult to deal with water. Um, but you can also use these, you know, rain barrels. You can put timers on them if you wanted to use them for irrigation of your veggie gardens or anything like that. Um, you need to put, if you want to use it as kind of a hose, you would need to put a little submersible pump in there, but seen all kinds of creative uses for these rain barrels. I mentioned pervious hardscaping. Um, this is um, that pervious hardscaping or pervious concrete at the Arboretum. Um, you can see we actually have a, a drain right here. This actually goes to our stormwater infiltration zone. Um, but this is a good example that you don't have to do an entire parking lot in um, uh, pervious concrete. There is a, a, a maintenance that is associated with, you have to vacuum this. So it's a little bit difficult maintenance, but we have this smaller section and the parking lot is um, graded so that the water has to flow over this small portion before it hits that drain. Uh, so it's quite effective. Um, you know, for your home driveway, for home pathways, these interlocking pavers may be a good choice. Um, I think gravel driveways are wonderful. Um, I think you can make them look really sharp with some edging. Um, there's a lot of really interesting engineered solutions um, for underlayment that can keep, keep them held in place as well. Um, you know, you guys are mostly gardeners. And so I wanna put a plug in for pervious pathways. And so this is a way to, you know, increase your garden bed. So putting pathways and pervious pathways in areas where you are always, you're gonna be walking or you wanna have a seating area and then having your garden beds around that. Um, so again, you know, you've got natural areas over here, you've got pervious pathways. So you're always giving an opportunity for that water to infiltrate back down into the ground. And that last, I just wanna, so these are, you know, all, all your other simple measures you can do. Just wanna always put in a big plug for trees as stormwater control measures. You know, we tend to, um, we tend to, when we create a new development, it's easy to clear the whole area. Um, but what we do is we lose these big canopy trees and then we come back and we replant with uh, much smaller trees. I mean, and 
to be honest, mostly crepe myrtles. And, you know, so we lose these huge canopy trees that are really functional. Um, and then we replace them with much smaller trees. Um, but these trees, these big canopy trees, they buffer precipitation. Um, they're gonna have, you know, roots that are gonna hold um, soil in place. They're gonna help um, increase uh, organic material in the soil. So they're just so important. And it's important for us when we lose these big trees that we're making sure to replace them in the canopy. I have two big live oaks in my front yard and I love them. And um, so uh, this is a cool tree benefits calculator that you can plug in what kind of tree you have and look at the different benefits. And there are enormous, you know, energy, air quality, carbon dioxide um, benefits to this, but you can look at the stormwater value of this tree. Uh, so a 30 inch live oak will intercept almost 12,000 gallons of stormwater runoff in a year. So um, these big trees are just fantastic. Okay, so you guys came to hear about rain gardens and now we're gonna talk about rain gardens. So what is a rain garden? Basically, we can think of a rain garden as a, a garden shaped like a bowl. You know, we, we have always uh, thought about um, our garden beds, our landscaping beds, and we kind of make them sort of mound shaped. So we can just invert that. Think about your garden beds and including a basin in your garden bed. So these are designed to capture rainfall runoff. Um, they allow water to filter into the ground. We're gonna um, put mulch in there. We're gonna put plants. Um, all of those things are gonna help filter those pollutants. Um, but this can be a really attractive addition to the landscape. And you know, as we talked about, um, you can plant these out with amazing native plants to be able to you know, not only take care of the water, but be able to provide a benefit for, for wildlife as well. So basically, you know, three components to a rain garden. The rain's gonna fall, um, you're gonna store that water for a while, maybe it'll sit there for, for a, a, you know, less than three days, and then that water is gonna infiltrate back down into the ground. But the benefits of rain gardens and these smaller scale um, stormwater control measures are vast. Uh, you're gonna help filter that rainwater runoff before it reaches our local waterway. You're gonna absorb nutrients, some heavy metals. There's a lot of biochemical processes happening in there. You're gonna help protect communities from flooding by holding that water on your property. Um, replenish aquifers, it can be really beautiful. And then, you know, you can plant it out with um, plants that will provide larval host, host plants for insects, um, you know, uh, overwintering nesting areas for other insects, and then th that will provide benefits um, up the food chain as well. So when we're siting our rain garden, uh, and if you're thinking about your property in your own yard, what you really wanna do is you wanna cut off um, that source of runoff um, from its destination. So, you know, if it's heading out to the road and it's going into a drain, how could we, how could we put a rain garden in there um, uh, in between where that water is coming um, and then where it's going to? And the, the components that we have are, of a rain garden are going to be where the water comes in, the inlet, it's going to have a basin, that uh, water is gonna infiltrate down in. And then we always have to have an overflow area because it's designed to capture um, about an inch of rain. And then as a, if we get more than that, if we get a really big storm, it needs a, some place to go as that basin fills up. So we wanna find a good spot. Um, and the best way to do that is really, you know, stand out in the rain like a crazy person in your yard and see where the water is flowing and where, where it's going to. Um, we want to locate it at least 10 feet away from the house foundation if you have a crawl space. We don't want that water to go into or underneath your house. Um, you want to locate it down slope of a, a foundation, again, away from the house. And if we have a septic system, we want it to be at least 25 feet and down slope of a septic field. So we can see this um, is a rain garden that's at the New Hanover County Arboretum. And this is just an ideal, it's a you know, small little area, but we have two downspouts coming off of our education center. Um, we've got rocks here to dissipate the energy of that water because it comes out pretty fast. Um, and then this little basin fills up. One of the great things, um, uh, sorry, Linda, you live in the Piedmont, but down here at the coast, 
we've got wonderful sandy soil and it infiltrates really fast. Um, so that makes, you know, makes it a little bit easier. If you live, uh, you know, in an area where you have a lot of clay, um, it can be a little bit more challenging with infiltration. Um, but there are, you know, you might just have to have a backyard wetland um, or amend that soil uh, more to make it a little more um, uh, uh, pervious. So the best site will be in partial to full sun. Uh, so we want that UV radiation to help um, break down any bacteria in that, um, in that water, um, in that area. So at least four hours of sunlight. Um, this is actually a rain garden uh, in a friend of mine's yard. They actually had this installed uh, through CCAP funds with our local soil and water conservation district. Um, and the reason that they needed this rain garden was that um, they live right here on Hewlett's Creek. That's right across uh, through this forested area. Um, and then they have this area here along the road um, was always very soggy. Every time it rained, this was kind of a low point in their yard. So it was just always wet, couldn't park a car there, would get stuck. So they ended up putting this rain garden in the center of their yard to create a basin here. Um, and so now as water flows across their yard, it stops here um, and doesn't go down here. And it's allowed this area down here to dry out. Um, they planted it out beautifully. They ended up asking for this um, border on it um, to help with maintenance and stop the grass from growing inside of it. So the best source of water um, and the easiest source of water for your rain garden is uh, your downspouts. That's because you can really route it to wherever you want it to go. Um, you can see here, you know, you can have it close to where the downspout is. You can bury um, piping underground. You can see this, the, these folks, here's their downspout here, and they've actually buried a corrugated pipe underground. They've got it coming out here into this larger rain garden here. So the first thing you need to do if you've chosen a site is you need to figure out what, you know, what your infiltration rate is on your, um, in that spot. So you do this by doing an infiltration test. You're gonna dig a hole one foot, one foot deep and you're gonna fill it with water. And then you're gonna set the timer. You're gonna see how long it takes for that water to soak into the ground. Now, hopefully you have a nice um, uh, sandy loam area because that's, that's kind of the ideal um, combination of soil um, that's going to be really, really, you know, it's gonna drain incredibly fast. Um, the more clay you have, the slower it's going to drain. Um, in general, here at the coast, we're going to have mostly quick draining rain gardens. So, um, you know, they're going to drain less than 12 hours. So you might have standing water there for a bit. It's really going to drain very quickly. A standard rain garden, uh, you may hold water there for 12 to 72 hours. But if water is going to be sitting there for longer than three days, we would consider this a wetland garden. And that's totally fine. You can have a wetland garden. You're just going to have to choose different plants um, in that garden, uh, plants that are going to be tolerant of standing water for longer periods of time. So question, I have heavy clay. Um, can I have a rain garden? The answer is maybe. Um, again, you just might have to design it to be larger, shallower. Um, you can amend the clay. Um, so you're just gonna have to um, be a little more creative to be able to deal with that heavy clay soil. And it's just probably gonna be more like a wetland garden. Um, so, but, you know, I think we can lean into these areas in our yard instead of trying to fight against water and fill it and push that water off our properties, we can lean into these areas and create these beautiful backyard wetlands. Um, a lot of people worry about mosquitoes but if you have an area where you have diverse plants, you're going to be inviting, um, uh, you know, frogs. You're going to be inviting um, dragonfly and dragonfly nymphs that are going to be predators of these um, of these mosquito larvae. You can also use things like um, mosquito dunks um, that can help with that issue as well. A lot of people ask the question, you know, if I have a rain garden, is it going to breed mosquitoes? And the answer is no. If it's if it's draining within three days, um, then it's not possible to grow mosquitoes in there. It takes at least seven days from the time that a mosquito lays an egg to the time that it emerges as an adult. So if your rain garden is draining within three days, it, it has it, there is not enough time for that um, mosquito to complete its life cycle. 
Okay, so now we've got a spot. We've done our infiltration test. We need to size the rain garden. So we want to size that rain garden um, based upon the size of our, our watershed. So that's whatever impervious surface you're draining from. And usually that's a rooftop or a driveway. So um, in this little scenario right here, we, we are gonna treat this rooftop right here. Um, so we're gonna dust off our old uh, length times width, our, our area here. So um, we've got here uh, 10 by 40 rooftop here. You can see they've got a downspout that comes down here. They're gonna route it to this area. We wanna know how big to make our rain garden. So we're gonna determine the size of our watershed. That's 10 by 40. So this watershed is 400 square feet. So how big, so if we have that 400 square feet, how big should the rain garden be? Um, your rain garden should be at least 10% of the impervious surface uh, that you're draining to the rain garden. We're gonna design it upon 10 inches of rainwater on top of the mulch. Um, and so rain gardens that are 10% of the watershed and have a 10 inch ponding depth should capture the major majority of one inch storms. Um, so, uh, so now I'm gonna go through a kind of a, uh, an example and this one's personal because this is actually my own backyard here. Um, so I, I always giggle at this picture because this is Google Earth and this is a great way to size, you know, to figure out the size of your um, rooftop. You know, you're not gonna get up there with a measuring tape but you can look up your address, look up the um, aerial photos of your property. And I always laugh because we were having a, um, a oyster roast one year. And so that's what that big tent is in my backyard. But you can, there'll be a little scale here on the bottom. So that'll help you measure. So, you know, I mentioned that I was having some, my yard has a flat area up here and then it actually slopes away so I was having ponding of water up here and it would be really wet. And then I was having some erosion issues. So I have two downspouts, one here and one here where these little red stars are. I really wanted to put a rain garden here. So I wanted to hold that water in that, in that space rather than flowing out into the yard. Um, and then eventually flowing down this hill and into Hewlett's Creek or into my neighbor's yards. Um, so, I first needed to figure out the area of impervious surface that I was going to be treating. So um, using my little scale here, I figured out that this is 15 by 10 on each side of this roof right here. There's a, a gutter that runs here and a gutter that runs here. Um, so I figured out the total area of my watershed. So 10 by 15 and 10 by 15. So that total area is 300 square feet. So I'm gonna multiply my watershed size by 10% or 0.1. So my rain garden in that space needed to be 30 square feet. Um, so my rain garden could be five by six, you know, it can be any sort of um, combination that would work. And I always tell people, you know, it does, your rain garden, so if you need a hundred square foot rain garden, it doesn't need to be a square 10 by 10. You can really work within this. I find these kidney bean or peanut shapes look really aesthetically pleasing um, uh, for, for your uh, shape of your rain garden. So this is another example. This is actually my, my neighbor's house. Um, so, you know, I was treating both of those downspouts, but if you had a spot where you were, you know, she's just got a flat roof. So it's, you know, 20 by 75. She's got three downspouts, one, two, three. If she wanted to put a rain garden right here and have just the water from this um, downspout going to this rain garden, she'd just be treating a third of this. Um, so you can, she's got a 1500 square foot watershed. We're gonna divide that by the number of downspouts she has. So 500 square feet. Uh, so we're just treating a third of that roof. Um, and then the size of the rain garden would need to be 50 square feet here over in this area to treat that one downspout. So when we're designing our when we're designing our rain garden, we want to um, we want to make these look good. You know, we want to incorporate these into garden beds. Um, so this is one thing I always say: avoid the orphan garden. And this is true of any garden bed. Um, we don't want it to look like it just dropped out of the sky. You know that it's this this you know garden that's connected to nothing. Um, 
you know, if, if it's going to be on its own, it needs to be large enough to be a landscape feature. Um, and we also want to design these with maintenance in mind. So, um, so with this garden here on the top, we've got this little strip of turf right here. This is going to be a nightmare to one, keep the turf out of here. It would have been better to create a whole garden bed and cut out all of this turf here um, and then incorporate a rain garden into um, this entire area and landscape out the entire area rather than leaving these little bits of turf here. Um, again, if it's going to be on its own, um, we can see here another example of the rain garden that fell from the sky. I would have taken out all of this turf here and, and incorporated this rain garden um, into the entire foundational planting. Um, I keep um, telling folks, you know, we keep um, encouraging people to reduce the size of their lawn. But sometimes I think that sounds very negative. So I try to spin it around and make a positive and I say, increase the size of your uh, garden beds. So makes it a much more positive way. So, you know, make these garden beds uh, much, much bigger to incorporate these features into them. Um, I, I, I think it also should, you know, blend in with your existing um, plantings and topography. So you can see here, they had a depression here already. Um, they planted this out. I think this is really cool. This is at a commercial property here. And you can see that they've just, you know, this was the original um, uh, landscaping. They've just added this on to this, you know, original landscaping. And I think this looks just absolutely fantastic, really tidy. Um, and yet it's really, really functional as well. So, okay, it's time to construct the rain garden. It may be helpful for you to draw up a plan. Um, but when we're ready to build, we you know need to gather our gather our uh, our tools. Um, it may be helpful for you to draw it on the ground or put out stakes, you know. Um, but what we're what we always want to do before we dig, especially if we're digging an area we're not sure of, um, we want to call before we dig. And this is important if you are getting a commercial person, um, a commercial landscaper coming with heavy equipment. If you're going to be digging down. You need to call before you dig so that you're not hitting um, electric lines, you're not hitting gas lines. Um, they'll come out um, and they will mark those underground utilities for you. It was also when I'd be careful with your existing um, irrigation and things like that as well. No fun to start a project and then have to repair your irrigation after that. Okay, so we're going to remove turf. Um, you can see in this example, um, these folks live kind of on a, on a hill here, so they're going to um, stop the water from running down the hill. They're going to stop it here with this little berm. Um, we're going to, after we've removed the turf, we're going to dig to account for 10 inches ponding depth. You can see here they've used um, some of that turf as to create a berm here on the edges. Um, and a lot of times when we do these kinds of projects, what we find is the, you know, that soil is really compacted. Um, so we want to really rough that up. We can add in some good quality compost um, to that, really turn that soil around, um, and that will help um, with drainage and with plants in there as well. We'll smooth it all out. Hard rakes are really great for moving soil around and, um, and really grading that quite well. Um, and then we want to make sure that we we figure out where the water will go if we overflow. So you know these rain gardens are designed to capture a one inch rainfall, um, so they should have an, an inlet, um, but they need to have an overflow. So you need to figure out where the water will go, um, and then you can create a structure um, that will allow that water to overflow. That way we're not just flowing out all over the sides. We can put some rocks, create a little weir. So as it, as it rises, it can overflow um, through that little uh, weir structure. So this is a good example of a, um, a rain garden installation that's out at the Brunswick County um, Government Complex at the Cooperative Extension. They have a wonderful botanical garden out there um, that is so educational. Um, and they have incorporated this um, rain garden. And this is actually a garden that they had planned called the curb appeal garden. Um, so it's really a foundational planting. Um, but the issue was that um, right along this building they had, um, there's no downspouts, but there are, let's see, is there a picture? Uh, there, 
there's just scuppers. There's just these openings. It's a flat roof building. There are scuppers up at the rooftop and water when it rains just rockets off this building. Um, so we really had to figure out a way to deal with the water because it's, it was always wet here. The turf was squishy after every rainstorm. Um, so what we did, you know, we, we designed and created this um, basin here. We put these rocks here uh, to take that, that velocity, that, that energy of that water coming off there. Um, it ponds really beautifully. And this is our overflow structure here. So if the water rises to a certain level, it can overflow here. And you can see we've created a dry stream bed. Um, and so as this pond fills up, it can overflow into the dry stream bed and, and head out through that garden. So you can see here, this is, you know, this is after, you know, an in-train um, and it really, a lot of water fills up in this basin. Um, we've planted out, um, this is I think Virginia sweet spire here. We've got ink berries and river oats along the path. Um, it's planted out quite beautifully now with some uh, dwarf palmettos. So um, it's just a really beautiful example of what you can do to incorporate a really functional feature and really kind of a formal um, landscaping bed. After we're done constructing our, our garden and planting it out, we want to mulch it with um, hardwood mulch. Um, that's going to do a good job uh, at holding that moisture in there for the plants, but it's also not going to float whenever we have uh, water ponding in there. So you can see they have, uh, this is their inlet here, and this is their outlet structure here as it, as it overflows. If you have areas, you know, where they're, they're wet, you can kind of lean into that. You can mulch that out, put it in with some plants that are, you know, rather than trying to figure out how to deal with this area, you know, lean into it, plant plants that are going to appreciate that, that spot in your yard. I like this. I think this is a really cool idea. Um, these folks, you know, they, they must have had water that runs this way. Um, and they've actually just dug out huge basin in, in a big part of their yard and planted it out. Um, so, you know, I see, I'm seeing this more and more expanding the size of garden beds. Um, and, uh, oh, actually, no, here's their inlet right here. I've never seen that. Uh, so here's their inlet right here, and this must be their outlet here. But I think this is just a nice natural feature um, in the yard. We see here again a more formal um, example. Um, I think, well, I was going to say that's an American fringe tree, but I'm not sure. Um, but the, you know, we've got downspouts coming in here. But again, this is just a nice retrofit of adding this rain garden on here. Um, rather than letting that water run away and it can fill up this nice basin, but it looks very formal um, and very structured. Um, yeah, so you can move water, you know, if it needs to be farther away from where the water is coming from, you can have an underground uh, corrugated pipe, you can have a dry stream bed um, that can move the water to a, um, to a rain garden. So I mentioned the Brunswick County complex, um, just a really great um, functional landscape. Um, this is it actually landscaped out here. We've got a Sweet Bay Magnolia um, and just you know nice native landscaping and incorporated some non-natives as well. Um, so this is actually my rain garden at my house. I showed you, you know, I, I, I got my shovel out. I dug myself out uh, my rain garden so you can see the basin here. I um, mean, you can see the, the inputs into that basin. I have a rain, a rain barrel right here. And so actually this is, it takes the overflow from that rain barrel. And then this is the other um, downspout that comes into this. You can see it makes an excellent cat watering dish whenever it rains, um, but you can see that it's really functional. You know, I just, I expanded this bed and made this bed much larger. Um, to incorporate this landscape feature. And I love the way this looks. I just think it, it looks fantastic and it's really functional. It really fills up here um, after a rainstorm. I finished, uh, I finished it out with pine straw. Um, I think I've got some examples of what's planted in there. I, I planted a Sweet Bay Magnolia, which I'm in love with. Um, and again, this is this examples of, uh, you know, plants that you can put in here that are gonna be functional. They're gonna love the, you know, having, you know, they'll be able to deal with, you know, some wet feet for a little while, but then they're gonna be able to be drought resistant in between. And of course, uh, you guys probably know Sweet Bay Magnolia is one of the larval hosts for 
um, spicebush swallowtails and eastern sw tiger swallowtail butterflies. So I just think this is a beautiful smaller scale tree um, that can fit well in our coastal landscapes. I've got it planted with beautyberry, which I think is just a, I, I love that pow, um, beautiful fall color of the berries. Um, that are just, you know, beloved by birds. So we get to do, enjoy them for a little while and then the birds get to them. Um, I've got some dwarf palmettos in there now um, that I think is a great uh, textural plant to have, especially if you need, you have plants that are deciduous. It's nice to have something that's evergreen um, throughout the winter as well. Um, muley grass, I think is just, a, you know, a workhorse in the garden that always looks good. Um, so I've planted out with that. Again, that's higher on the banks um, where it's a little uh, drier. Um, I have Golden Alexander. I'm a big fan of um, host plants for butterflies. I love to see them in the garden. Um, so this is the, um, instead of um, black swallowtail caterpillars eating your parsley, although they, just, they do still eat my parsley, um, this would be the native host plant for black swallowtail caterpillars. Um, so um, I'm excited. I actually, um, I actually have the, a different species that is newer to me. I think it's Zizia aptera. Um, so I think it has, it has heart-shaped leaves. So it's a little bit different than this Zizia aurea. I don't have this yet, but I'm hoping to find it at the um, plant sale here coming up next week in New Hanover County. I don't know if they'll have it or not, but I'm looking for uh, looking for this to add it to my um, to my rain garden. So if any of you know where I can find this, but this is Blue Star or Amsonia. Um, I just think this is a beautiful plant um, and uh, and really really attractive to pollinators and butterflies. So my rain garden stays a little wetter in the center, even uh, you know uh, uh, even if the banks are dry. It still stays a little wet. It's, it's shady about half the day. So that in the basin of my rain garden, I have planted out with rushes. And I just think these have a great texture to them. These are great for pond buffers. They're just, you know, these are want to grow in wet ditches. So easy to grow. Um, you can see here, you know, don't be afraid to plant, you know, just uh, you don't have to go crazy and plant one of everything. Um, I think these are really beautiful examples of rain gardens that are planted out with all rushes um, at, right in the center here. I think this looks really, really striking. Also, along with my rushes, I have um, blue flag iris. Um, so I like that combination of, you know, something simple and uh, I like the rushes and then little pops of purple when you get your irises um, blooming. So that's it. So I hope I've wet your whistle. We could go on and on. I could talk for a whole nother hour about plants, but that will give you guys um, some inspiration, um, maybe to start some planning and get digging this fall here. So I'd be happy to take any questions you guys have. Yeah, Amy, what we're going to do is have the people put the questions in the chat. Okay. And so folks, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat and then uh, I will read them off to you so that uh, you don't have to sit there and read them. So let's okay. see. See what shows up in the chat. Uh, where is it? There it is. I got one. Well, I will tell you guys that I did put a spreadsheet in the chat. It's yeah. a list of rain garden um, certified rain garden professionals. That's a certification through NC State's Bio and Ag Engineering. So if you're looking for somebody to do this work for you, um, these would be um, you know there's there's companies within there that are certified in this um, that that can help you out. Okay, well, I don't, I don't see any questions in there. We'll give people a little bit of time. And uh, while we're doing that, I'll talk about my <laughs> rain garden. My issue is I just have a lot of pennywort just kicking over. Mm -hmm. that I, I almost have to give up on it because I just can't battle it. It's, um, it's, I'm trying to think of what I can do. I might dig out the rain garden all over again and put new gravel, put some gravel in and everything else. And then, I don't know, I don't want to use any pesticides or uh, yeah, pesticides or anything. That. So I've been out there many times on my hands and knees, digging out <clears throat> pennywort. Yeah, pennywort is tough because it's, you know, um, it, it loves little, little moist, rhizomes and poor soil. Yeah. It comes right back. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So, so uh, 
I, I don't have a good solution. I have always said that if I ever wanted a lawn, it's just going to be penny warp period. You know, I'm trying, I'm, I'm just sort of coming to peace with penny warp. Um, <laughs> Lloyd Singleton had an article uh, that he shared with me about, it's some research from uh, University of Florida, and it was an article that was called Self-Replicating Lawns. And uh, it was about lawns that kind of reseed themselves, like, again, leaning into yards or, or you know, instead of these monocultures of turf, just, you know, allowing those plants that want to seed themselves spread easily, you know, and I was like, oh, that's great. I've been doing that forever because my whole yard is just weeds holding hands to, with each other. So. Well, we got some uh, questions here, but before I do that, I'll say what I've done with my penny work is, uh, I've accepted it, but I plant a lot of Coreopsis and all kinds of black eyed Susan and everything else. So after the spring, about now, they start growing up taller and I can't see the pennywort because it's it's shaded by all the other other plants. So that's my battle against pennywort. I just hide it. There you go. There you go. Anyway, okay, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, it says, uh, do you know what the name of the material is that is used to hold gravel driveways and such in place? You know, hold on. I think it's, I want to say it's called, there's a lot of different um, brands and like, like hex paver or, so the, it just depends on the brand, but, but they're like a grid system. So, um, yeah, I think there's just a lot of different um, brands for it. I'm trying to look and see if there's, it's like it's a driveway fabric. Yeah, it's, so there's just, I don't know that there's a specific name for it, but there's a lot of different um, brand names. But if you typed in gravel driveway underlayment, um, you would find a lot of different systems that, that would work. Um, and there are companies who, if you, you know, I mentioned that Thorpe landscaping, you know, there are a lot of companies that will um, install these and, and make them re really beautiful as well. I have a um, sort of an answer to this question, but not really. I have a gravel driveway. I have a concrete driveway down to my house and I have a gravel driveway going around the side of my house. Hmm. That gravel driveway around the side of the house is held in place because it's fairly thin and it's just embedded in dirt. Oh <laughs> so yeah. It is gravel. Mm -hmm. and it stays in place because it's kind of embedded in soil. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, I didn't design it that way. It just that's what happened. Yeah, okay. those those um, products um, like that underlayment are good if you have a, like a slope a sloping driveway, you yeah. know, and you're worried about that it like rolling out into the road and things like that. Yeah. I saw a really cool gravel driveway on the Azalea Garden Tour, and she had a uh, probably a eight foot section at the end of the driveway that was brick. It was a really neat pattern. And then she had um, bricks, single bricks uh, in the lines going across because she had quite a slope, but it seemed to hold the gravel in place and it looked very sharp too. Oh, good. It looked expensive uh, also. Says, Charlie, did you know your camera's off? And I said, yes, I, I'll answer that one because I guess I do have, know it's off. <laughs> I've got a flower in my place. Or oh, there's a Charlie. I've got two things going on. I got my uh, laptop on and I've got my computer on. The laptop is no video and the computer has a flower in its place. Uh, anyway, let's go back up. There's how far should your rain garden be from a septic field uphill and downhill? Downhill, we, we definitely want to be 25 feet away. Uphill, we want to be careful. I, I know 25 feet would be the, the shortest distance you would have it away, but you would want to make sure that you're, you know, because you would be, you know, you'd have that pipe that's running underground. So you'd want to be really cautious of putting it right in line with your septic field. So at least 25 feet downhill, um, maybe not exactly in line with your um, uphill of your septic system. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know where my septic field is exactly. I have an idea where it is. Mm -hmm. but I have a situation where my whole lot is on a slope. The street is the high end and my marsh is the low end. Mm. So I get runoff from the street 
And so I have to channel my water. And one of the things I do is I channel it to a sort of a rain garden. Oh, cool. But way I to go, think, Charlie. I That's awesome. Heading, I think it's heading for my probably close to my uh, septic field, but I didn't have much mm. choice. I, no, no. Yeah, yeah sometimes you gotta you gotta wiggle things and yeah, uh, yeah. and work with what you got. Anyway, well, that seems to be the end of the questions, but uh, I have a couple of things to say here at the end. Um, one, we talk about what we, I got up and coming, and uh, I haven't sent out the announcement to our members yet, but we're going to have a field a walk to the ghost savannah. And if you don't know what that is, Google that. It's a very interesting place that goes back to the real savannah was D.D. Wells back, uh, back in the early part of the 20th century. But uh, it got destroyed, and now they have a ghost savanna, which is similar place, and it's something like 125 species of flowers, plants there that uh, we're going to go visit it on, on in middle of May, 15th of May, and uh, I'll be sending out the announcement. We're going to have a limit limit of how many can do that, so if you're interested in that and you see that announcement, sign up quickly. And I have another one, and I don't have the date down. It's after that, and I'll have to confirm the date. But we're going to have the uh, a, a, a gathering at the UNCW greenhouse. Uh, the new greenhouse, relatively new greenhouse manager. She is going to hold a session on cuttings, propagating from cuttings, which I've always been interested in. So I will. I think that's the end of May, but I'll have to confirm that and send out the announcement to that. So that's the only two things we got coming up that I know of. I'm trying to schedule some walks in June. I haven't got anything going yet. But one of the last things I want to say is uh, I sent this out to non-members. So if there's any non-members in the, our audience right now and they are interested in joining, please just go to ncwildflower.org and there's a tab for join. And uh, then there's the uh, sign up for the uh, fill out a form and join up. And if you uh, join up and you're in our area here, uh, Tinder, New Hanover and or Brunswick, you will be assigned to this chapter here. And so that's the way that works. So did any other uh, got favorite rain garden plants for winter? Oh, here's some more questions. Uh, favorite rain garden plants for winter interest. Favorite rain garden plants for winter interest. Well, um, I mean, I like the rushes because they will stay evergreen throughout the winter, but I am a big fan of grasses and so obviously these might not you know could be in the basin of your you know if you had a drier uh, rain garden but I love um, grasses in the winter because I love that texture that rustle so if you have native grasses you know leave them up all winter um, and you'll have you know it'll be room for overwintering insects give you that texture you know maybe old seed heads on there um, and then you can cut them back, you know, in the spring, in March, usually. But I, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of native grasses. And I like having, you know, masses of different grasses. Um, you know, our, our director here, Lloyd, always says brown is a color too. So allow that, you know, allow those plants to go dormant, um, to, you know, have, have that time. I just think that, that gives you some nice winter interest. I don't know if this would serve in a rain garden, but uh, one of my favorite plants in my yard is a grass, which is the inland sea oats. And what is it? Inland sea oats. Inland sea oats. Oh, okay, cool. Actually, I, I have trouble with the Latin names. If I say it, I'll know it. But, but uh, Is it river oats? No, it's similar to the river oats, and it's also similar to the dune oats, but it only gets to be about three foot tall. Oh. But it has the same kind of seed pod as the dune oats with that little flat mm -hmm. seed. Mm -hmm. And in the, after it's gone green, brown, and it's just pretty little rustling in the wind even when it's dry. Yeah, I leave them I up all year round. Yeah. yeah. I've even 
cut after after they dried. I've even cut them and put them in flower arrangement. Oh yeah, I bet that looks great. Because it's really neat. Uh, mm -hmm. But they just become a little clump, and I'm going to have to try putting that in or around my rain garden and see how it does. See if it survives. It survives okay. anywhere in my yard. From yeah, that's happy. Run off from the street, so it probably would do all right over there. Mm -hmm. Hey, and Charlie, I picked I pick some of that up from you on Friday at the Earth Day in Sunset Beach. Right. Didn't you say it needed shade? Well, it does like shade, yeah. I don't okay. know. If it, I think it's partial sun. Oh, no, okay. I just have to say mine is all growing in the shade, not by plan. That's just where it, I'm a very disorganized gardener. I have a little space to put something. I'll put something there and if it survives, I say, well, that was a good place. If it dies, I say, well, I didn't do good. <laughs> but those, uh, all my uh, inland sea oats are just growing all over my yard and they're all in shade. But I have to say, most of my yard is shade because I have 16 live oaks in my yard. So nice. most of my yard is shade. Yeah. So, so I'm, except right near the street in the morning, I'll get the morning sun for five or six hours. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on the time of year. Oh. And uh, yeah, some of my river or uh, inland oaks are going to get some sun there in the morning, but uh, mostly at shade. I think we're talking about the same thing because I think it's Chasmanthium latifolium. Um, yeah, and so um, the, yeah, I, I call them river oats, but um, but yeah, uh, I do love those and I love the the, the seed heads on those. I think yeah, yeah. yeah, that's that's it, that's it. Um, I don't want to yeah, there. About sure. a, another one that's a sedge, I believe, and uh, it has a little tri white. Oh, of, white top sedge. Yeah, love yeah. that one. Yeah, that one's great. I have that in my rain garden. It's not, I don't believe it's evergreen. Oh, I need to get some of that. Thank you, Charlie. But I love it. I love it. And yeah. Michael Abbott gave me some, and I had it in my rain garden till. I like to see my rain garden, some grasses came in there and uh, penny warts in there. I'm going to have to go out and rework my rain garden, but I don't want to. Or you're going to have to make friends with penny wart or something. Yeah, well, I like to say I hide it. I, yeah, there you go. But uh, Shaved what, it was up. That, what was that, that sedge? Would you call it? The, well, um, it's either called white top sedge or I've seen it called star sedge maybe too, but I call it white top sedge. And there's a couple of different versions of it. There's a real small one, and then there's a taller one. I had the one that was about 18 inches tall. So, oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Ring Cospera. And when we were walking in uh, Fort Fisher uh, Saturday, yeah. I, I had uh, John, Niz uh, John uh, Taggart was with us, and he pointed it out, the uh, white top sedge, the little one was there. And, uh, and he said, well, yeah, there's the larger one too. So anyway. Okay, well, I want to thank you all. Let's see if there's any new ones. Uh, there's, what's that? Well, there's the name of the white top sedge by Scopiola Langfolia. Okay, I'll have to write that one down. Yes. Anyway, thank you all for participating. And thank you again, Amy, for providing us with all that good information and inspiring me to get out to my rain garden and rework it. Hey, good. Thank you for inviting me. I had a lovely time.